it's now time to switch gears a little bit and move over to the off the grid segment. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is essentially the segment where I get to ask some unconventional questions and hopefully provide a new insight into Perry's personality and career. Um, well, I briefly brought up your book, Flat Out Flat Broke, but one thing I could sense from reading it was that your life as a driver was wild and rough around the edges. Um, going out into the pub, getting into fights, getting into crashes. Did you like living in the excitement of that environment? And do you feel that this may be something missing from motorsport today? Oh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I, I it, it's, it's just, I mean, you know, we were, we were all professional. I mean, yeah, I was, I was training and everything else. Um, it's just, I think everybody's got even more professional since. So there don't seem to be any punch ups anymore or, you know, nights down the pub. Yeah. No, even I didn't go down the pub the night before a race, you know? So I was like, maybe a, a, a bottle of beer or something, but you know, nothing mega like that. But during the week then, yeah, I mean, life was for living. So I was kind of fairly flat out and having a great time to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, during your racing days, you're often found with the group dubbed the Rat Pack by the media, um, and including the likes of Johnny Herbert, Damon Hill, you, who you discussed a little bit before, and then former Team C talk show guest Mark Blundell. Um, you those obviously losers. Were, sorry, who you All don't those know? Those losers, yeah. Those losers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, you were all very close with each other and mutually supportive, but how did you balance being friends and being competitors? It's a really good question, actually. Uh, it just came naturally. Um, you know, one of the things that you could rely upon with that little lot is that they were hard, um, but they weren't stupid, you know? And it was the same with me. I was, yeah, I would never deliberately take somebody off the track. I mean, it's happened as a mistake. You know, but I would never deliberately do it. Sorry, I should edit that. Unless somebody tries to take me off the track, <laughs> I would never do it first. If somebody tries to take me off the track, then yeah, they would get it right back. And I would not quit until we both went in the wall or they did, you know? So, but I don't, that's not the way I wanted to drive. And we were all, all felt the same way. Martin Donnelly could be pretty hard to be quite honest, but they were all, you know, fabulously talented racing drivers. And, uh, you know, we we just we box fair, but it was hard. And then after the race, we'd have a giggle, have a laugh, maybe go to the pub and and see each other away from racing as well. So yeah, it's you're right. It's a nice question, and and we're we're proud to have all been such great mates and friends. Continue to this day. Was there ever an affirmation as to who the best dig was, i.e., the fastest? Because according it's to easy, ben that you don't you don't need to say anything more. It was me. <laughs> yeah okay don't worry about the others Sid. it was it was me okay the others rubbish okay okay because the the only reason i ask is because i've also i read your book and i've also read ben collins book so for who for those who don't know ben collins is who, uh the person who played the stake after perry and i i remember really well when um when ben collins was going to do testing um with andy wilman i think it was there, you know, he he recounted how Andy Woman was like, "Oh wow, he's faster than Perry's times." So oh, that's no, 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 not not just faster than the the fastest I'd ever been. He did it on his very first lap. Yeah, it's something like that. I don't know. Yeah, wow, he's amazing. It was, you know, I don't think he did, but he put it in the book. <laughs> it's so, hilarious. So, do do you not think very highly of the other stigs then? Oh, not him, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Did, do you yeah. know who the current stig is? I think the current stig's been there around for 10 years, right? Still anonymous. I don't know. I think they might be using different ones. Different you ones. Know, it's, uh, I, you know, there was, I, w I did watch a show recently where there was a, the, the stig was on. And whoever it was, I thought, oh, he's pretty good. Yeah. I, I, saw, I saw him do some stuff and I thought that was good. Um, there was a really funny moment actually when I was watching the show many years ago and suddenly the Stig was out driving this Ferrari and I looked and I went and my wife was watching it as well and even Karen turned around and said you know I was quite proud of it course, actually she turned around and said um who uh who's driving that I said I don't know but it's good you know and suddenly, of course, they did the reveal afterwards. It was Michael. Yeah, Michael Schumacher <laughs> pretending to be the stick for the day. But I tell you, it showed. 
you know, I could see it on TV how good that guy was. And they don't come a lot more brilliant than Michael, you know? Yeah, that's I do remember very well that one episode with Michael Schumacher. Um, it was pretty unexpected. So throughout your career, you've spent a good amount of time doing after dinner speaking. Um, on Top Gear, Clarkson and crew had a challenge with cheap off-roaders where the punishment was after dinner speaking. Have you ever tried to help them overcome their fear of after dinner speaking? What, Jeremy, James, and Richard? Yeah, they. I, I believe it was... I, I'm just trying to go from memory here, but I think it was the very last episode that they did as a trio before they moved to Grand Tour. Oh, uh, I'd say I didn't see that show, but if they were pretending that they couldn't do after dinner speaking, really, they're pretending because all of them can, you know? They're all, you know, they're all, they've all got a great turn of phrase and they're, they're all quite witty and they, and they certainly know how to write and perform. So, I, you know, that, that was just for the camera, Sid. Just I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were messing around. Well, I think I, I don't doubt that they could do it, but I think they were they were talking more about how much they disliked doing it. Oh right. Oh okay. Um, yeah. Well, that that's a different thing. I mean, you know, I've I've given cranky about fifteen hundred speeches worldwide. Um, it's it's normally worked, but the funny thing is, you do remember. You know, there's literally just been a handful of occasions, less than that where it's, it's the evening didn't work out. You know, either the audience just weren't alive or just didn't like me or whatever. But you know when a joke doesn't land and you're standing there going, oh, start the car. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you kind of you kind of had to do a lot of speaking and jokes and stuff like that first to kind of gain favor with sponsors back in your racing days. And then you also did it to actually pay for your trips to the Grand Prix, right? Yeah, because the when I came into Formula One, uh, the team was so broke they couldn't afford to pay me, and they and they not even give me the travel expenses. Now, at the same token, we were completely broke here. You know, we were in the process of losing the house because I'd been racing in Formula Three Thousand, and I'd done I'd done a few property deals where I built up some money, but we signed the house off against the Formula Three Thousand drive. So that went goodbye to that. That was just three races in Formula 3000. And it was quite a nice house. It just shows you how expensive F3000 was, you know. And then in America, I wasn't getting paid, even though I was kind of, I was on pole a lot and leading, you know, an awful lot of the stuff. So you've got several years of not being paid, having to pay huge interest. And then by the time we got to F1, we, we were completely broke. And I still had to find more money to get to the track. So you're right. Um, there were tour operators that said, look, Perry, we'll fly you out there. We'll put you up in a hotel. But of an evening, you come and speak to all our guests and, you know, tell them what's been going on and tell them the stories and everything else. So I went, yeah, OK, fine. And that seemed to go well. And then the different agencies heard about me and just started saying, you know, can you come here? Can you come there? And yeah, it's it, as a as a kind of separate career, it it's ended up being pretty good. Yeah. So it's definitely something that came naturally. And uh Hey, right now, all of that experience is paying off, right? For all the that's, that's your polite about. that's that's your polite way of saying I've got a big mouth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hey, when it comes to interviewing someone, I really appreciate that. 